Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon after the lunch break. Uh, we are about to start our second panel of this day. Um, just give me a moment. I don't want to... Yeah, uh, the second panel, uh, which is entitled Modern Epidemics Between Trauma and Denial. And our first speaker is Małgorzata Sugiera, already at the spot. Uh, let me introduce you uh, Małgorzata Sugiera, who is a full professor at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow and head uh, of the Department for Performativity Studies. She was a research uh, fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, uh, DAAD, the American Andrew Mellon Foundation and the International Research, Research Center uh, interviewing performance and cultures at the Freie Universität in Berlin. Uh, her research concentrates on performativity theories, speculative and decolonial studies, particularly in the context of the history of science. She published and co-edited several books in Polish, as well as in English and German. Most recently, Crisis and Communitas, Performative Concepts of Commonality in Arts and Politics, published by Rutledge in 2023. Uh, she carries out a three-year international research uh, project, uh, Epidemics and Communities in Critical Theories, Artistic Practices and Speculative, fabulations of the last decades, fund, founded by the National uh, Science Center. And today, uh, Małgorzata Sugiera will present um, uh, a paper titled Imagined into Being, the Birth of the Modern Contagion Revisited. Małgorzata, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. And um, um, uh, good afternoon to everybody. As you may see, we will start actually from the very spot, the first panel, the previous panel uh, ended, uh, because I will begin with uh, the um, uh, Spanish flu, but uh, you may already see from the title, it will be not the historical approach to the uh, Spanish flu, but uh, from today's perspective, the, um, after the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic perspective. So we'll start with the question of being remembered as having been forgotten, as you already know, it was the case of uh, the Spanish flu. And um, the great pandemic or the great flu commonly dated 1918-1919, even though the um, same location suffered a fourth wave in 1920, seems all too paradoxical. The great pandemic was also misleadingly dubbed the Spanish flu, most probably because of the relative freedom of press in neutral Spain, which allowed for a full coverage of the epidemic's first wave censored in other countries. Also, its actual uh, place of origin is still disputed. The Great Flu must have emerged out of the poor sanitary condition of the Great War's Western Front and been spread to south the continents by the soldiers relocated between battlefields and coming back home after the war. Despite its relatively low fatality rate, the great flu infected over half of the world population of the time, and its death toll was conservatively esteemed at roughly over 50 million victims, which means that it significantly exceeded the death toll of both world wars. Nevertheless, for several decades, the historical event of such magnitude has been uh, consigned to the category of non-events excluded from official commemorations and left out of the standard historiographic and cultural narrative of the late modern era that stand in stark contrast to both the central place of the Great War in modern history and to the memory turn in the humanities. However, um, 
a 22-volume pandemic reawakings the forgotten and unforgotten Spanish flu of the 1918-1919, points out that recollection of the great flu, and I quote, were kept alive often in muted and obfuscated forms that could re-enter into public consciousness in various contexts, unquote. Such an important context was provided by consecutive influenza epidemics emerging every decade after the Second World War, the so-called Asian flu in the late 1950s, the Hong Kong flu in the late 1960s, the swine flu in the US in the 1976, and so on. The recurring uh, rediscoveries of the great pandemic, in particular over the previous two decades, which saw the great pandemic centennial, which increased number of publications, have formed a kind of pre-memory for the COVID-19 pandemic. In turn, the last pandemic has boosted renewed interest in the recovery of quote unquote, hidden memories concealed by social forgetting, which Guy Beiner, editor of the volume Pandemic Reawakings, defined as, and I quote, an oblique form of social remembrance sustained through tensions between public avoidance and the persistence of private or local recollections, unquote. Thus, the long neglected cultural legacy of the great flu, together with self-imposing parallels between then and now, are becoming the centerpiece of common interest today. Nevertheless, also two recent historical novels written by Nobel Prize winners during the COVID-19 pandemics look back at the early 20th century. They narrate other epidemics than the historically narrated. Um, uh, Spanish flu or the Great Flu. They do it, however, with a similar aim in view to imagine into being what has been socially forgotten. Modern contagions revisited as other stories. In his Nights of Plague from 2021, Orhan Pamuk gives the voice to a contemporary historian Mina Minger, who revisits the 1901 outbreak of the bubionic plaque in Mingeria, a fictional Mediterranean island, an outpost of the Ottoman Empire, that at the time declared its independence. The historian is, however, not a fictional protagonist of the novel, but its supposedly real-life author, who once or twice met also, and I quote, the novelist and history enthusiast Orhan Pamuk, unquote. To shed a new light on the decisive time in the history of her country, she draws on contradictory sources, but mainly over 100 private letters from the pre-Great War period written by a certain Princess Pakis, wife of an eminent quarantine doctor sent by the Sultan to contain the epidemic on the island. Not only was the historian born and brought up on the island, she also turns out to be a great granddaughter of the Princess Bakis, who penned her book against the Mingarian mainstream historiography, in particular scholarly manuals, to counteract social forgetting. Also, Mingaria is undoubtedly fictional. Pamuk lets his historian stress that, and I quote, similar events to those we have described had already unfolded before in a place not too far away. And another quotation, many of the defining political developments that took place in the Ottoman Empire after 1901 carried the traces and influences of the Mingarian Revolution. So in a sense, it is one of the events who spread uh, in the, into the past and into the future. In other words, Pamuk invites his reader to take part in a complex play of tightly, tightly entangled history and memory, fictions and factions. The same could be said about the second novel I am interested in, Olga Tokarczuk's Empusion 20. 
22, even though here the specific entanglement of fictions and factions have been designed differently. Indeed, the novel's action unfolds of a decade later in 1913, that is shortly before the outbreak of the Great War. It is set in a real-time Hulse resort Gubersdorf in the Sudeten Mountains, well known in Europe of that time, and visited by patients suffering from pulmonary diseases. Despite the authentic location, the novel is written in dialogue with a well-known classical novel, Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, which depicts a similar health resort in Swiss Davos. Unlike Mann, Tokarczuk focuses, however, on male patients from the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, visibly falling apart as the Ottoman Empire once did, so it the similarity to empires falling out. They spend their time misogynistically philosophizing about women and their social role, quoting openly or unknowingly the philosophers and writers of the Eastern canon. And unlike Mann, Tokarczuk introduces a more than human narrator because her novel is narrated from the bottom-up perspective of a mysterious we, voices of, and I quote from the novel, nameless dwellers of walls, floors, and cellings, unquote. What is more, and once again contrary to Mann's novel, those mysterious voices narrate a story of a young hermaphrodite or intersex engineering student from Lviv who makes use of their stay in the health resort to decide upon transgressing the normative sex binary and freely choosing their gender. Thus, Pamuk's and Tokarczuk novels not only rewrite the chosen contagion cases as her stories, or rather other stories, they also intentionally decenter the specific entanglement of nationalism, heteropatriarchy, and infections of the turn of the 20th century, monopolized by historiographical and epidemiological discourses. To this aim, they situate the action on the multi-ethnic and multi-religious fringes of collapsing empires to narrate the modern contagion in a subversive, counter-hegemonic perspective. What is at stake in these novels is the key question which my paper tries to answer. A crux of modern memory. In the great flu and modern memory, her afterwards to pandemic reawakings, Astrid Earle explains the paradox of the great flu. The event remained forgotten because it could not be codified into key forms of modern memory that evolve in the Western world. Significantly, as a veritable crux of the memory, she names, it, depend, it depends on a certain time of storytelling. Exactly this crux is addressed in by Pamuk, who lets Mina Minger write a novel cum history. Also, on the one hand, she remains an objective historian. On the other, she uses her intuition and imagination to engage her reader as a sentimental novelist. The Knights of Plague includes an interplay of historical facts with romantic details from the private life historical figures. The author introduces, however, another narrative logic to deconstruct the binary and demonstrate its workings tightly connected with the epidemiological discourses. As it happens, Sultan Abdul Hamid, who, all, who was also fascinated with Sherlock Holmes's murder mysteries, which also strongly impacted the Western outbreak narrative, um, that Pamuk intended to critically address the issue is clearly demonstrated by his choice of the plague as the contagion which, which decimates the population on the island of Nigeria. As recently recorded in the Richard Conniff's Endic Epidemics, it's a, it's a story of 20. 23, a story of the struggle against infectious diseases across three centuries. 
Building on Louis Pasteur's finding on microbes, Alexander Yershin identified the pathogen um, causing the plague in, in uh, 1894, but that time no vaccine yet existed. Though old-fashioned remedies had to be kept in use, also it was hard to attune them with an emerging concept and politics of public health. That is why, having failed to introduce the modern quarantine methods brought in from France, Pamuk's Dr. Nouri comes to the conclusion that, and I quote, the Sherlock Holmes methods stand no chance in the Orient or anywhere in the Ottoman Empire, end quote. The increasing westernization, westernization of the declining Ottoman Empire is, however, only seemingly an issue here. Both the modern quarantine methods and the new science of epidemiology were not only premised on the concept of outbreak, allowing to define an epidemic as an isolated, self-contained event. They were also interrelated with the system of governance of a nation state. To subvert both, Pamuk imagines his island as a meeting pot of various religious, political, commercial, and nationalist groups speaking Greek, French, Turkish, Arabic, and less local languages. Contrary to mainstream historical discourses which emphasize an early awakening of national sentiment on Hungaria, Knights of Plague shows the creation of a new state as an arbitrary act of a commander native to the island by making a career in the Ottoman army, who in his way wanted to enforce quarantine measures. So here we, we just... Um, uh, we're looking uh, for, for this close connection between the government and the quarantine, and Pamuk narrated exactly this, how the pandemic could be used to enforce uh, both quarantine measures, but nationalist politics as well. Sub subsequent quick changes of various governments demonstrate how the outbreak was used to alter the composition of Migerian population to make it into a nation state. Thus, Pamuk's novel not only addresses the cracks of modern memory and certain type of storytelling, it also spotlights the workings of the outbreak narrative and its deductive logic here the, um, the um, connection to um, Sherlock Holmes, on which the modern concept of global public health is uh, premised, subverting it at the same time. The Spanish lady we already spoke about or hear about. In popular culture, the great flu was often anthropomorphized in a female form and represented as an ominous image of the Spanish lady. The advent of germ theory forced writers to reconceptualize being infected as incubating or reproducing the other, which implicitly feminized all bodies, in particular by abjecting male bodies. Looking closely at the gender underpinnings of germ narrative in her figuring the other within, Laurel Bollinger emphasizes that the time was also marked by both sustained a debate over the role of women in the public sphere and the increasingly visible instability of gender roles. The Tokarczuk's novel ties in with the anxieties over embodiment of contagion, germ, and gender of that time is already demonstrated by its title. Empusian is a version of Empusa or Emposa invented by the author. The name denotes a shape shifting female being in Greek mythology to which the novel refers, quoting Aristophanes' comedy, The Frogs. Nonetheless, the title seems to be rather misleading. Also, the novel's protagonist enter the stage dressed as a man and exit in it in a female clothing, changing its shape, gender. Their body remains biologically the same, albeit anomalous, 
not fitting into the sex binary. Therefore, in female attire or not, the protagonist is a monster and an ontological scandal. The TB infection and the health resort treatment have clearly no influence on the patient body and its scandalous status. Therefore, why does the author present the entanglement of the intersex body, its infection, and the real life health resort? That's the question. It is for a reason that the subtitle of the Tokarczuk novel reads Physiotherapeutic Horror. Supposedly, the genre classification refers to the annual sacrifice of a young male patient of the health resort torn into shreds by some supposedly supernatural forces in nearby woods that is already investigated by an undercover police detective from Breslau. Here is another similarity between two novels, this kind of police... Uh, police um, uh, uh, um, uh, investigation. However, the sacrifice has also another more latent meaning, tightly connected to a sort of nata, nature management. Speaking about the tuberculosis etiology, the head doctor Semperweis comments, and I quote, you are cured by nature itself, unquote. However, the narrating voices in Tokarczuk's novel demonstrate that it is a partial truth only. Only one part of nature has been defined as a healing force and is allowed, allowed to be as such. The other part, resistant and unsubordinated, is said to breed only monsters. The author hints at it by situating a Dutch oil painting in the very center of her novel. Terminally ill and openly gay art student, owner of the painting, explains the represented sacrifice of Abraham from the Bible. Uh, and I quote, a sacrifice is a clear sign of human agency and authority over the world, unquote. Or rather, one could say of male agency and authority. Following his guidance, what happens annually in nearby woods is a sacrifice upon which the very existence of the health resort is premised. The art student not only bequests the painting to the protagonist, he also teaches them how to look at it to see the hidden truth of a divided and separated nature, so that is managed in a better way. Telling the story of the eponymous Empusion, a victim of a culture that demands not particular behavior, but rather particular kinds of bodies, the narrative voices teach the reader of Tokarczuk novel a similar lesson in looking askance through the real horror underneath physiotherapy and more broadly, the Western medicine. Towards a modern endemic. What is usually called a Western modernity is a very complex set of phenomena in which dominant as subaltern perspective coexist and constitute rival modernities. So writes a Portuguese sociologist Bonaventura de Sousa Santos in his Epistemologies of the South. It's a book from 2014. To secure a better future, he insists, we have to imagine a new our pasts, which have been suppressed, silenced, or marginalized by the monoculture of the moderns in Europe. The monoculture also introduced the concept of the modern contagion. Both of my examples demonstrate that not only. Uh, aha, okay. The Republic of the South and. Um, demonstrate that not only the great flu uh, could be remembered as having been forgotten, also other contagions have been forgotten as intrinsic part of our culture, uh, as it endemic cultural perspective. That is why already a few years before the COVID-19 pandemic, the editors of the volume endemic essays in contagion theory spotlighted another paradox. 
the paradox of, and I quote, the persistence of contagious rhetoric and logic in a society that has ide ideologically construed itself as impervious to infectious disease, unquote. They also try to theorize contagion as an operant through an endemic prevalence in discourse and society. In my reading, Pamuk's Night of Black and Tokarczuk's Empusian addresses address a similar challenge. They imagine our past anew and demonstrate that the Western modernity and contagion are co-constituted, so as to tell other, other stories and stories of others. And thank you very much indeed. after a very insightful uh, paper, speech. And our next speaker is Slavica Surbinowska. Uh, she's a professor of theory and methodology of literature and comparative poetics at the Department of Comparative Literature uh, at the Faculty of Philology, Blaze Koneski, at the University of Science, uh, Cyril and Methodius in Skopje. Uh, Slavica provided us a very comprehensive list of publications, but I allow myself uh, to just mention the recent ones as uh, in dialogue with the negative representation, narration, film and interpretation from 2019, uh, the philosophy of point the view uh, Skopje 2020 and the power of the narration and the brutality of the political from 2021. Uh, Slavica have uh, several uh, uh, collaboration in the projects of the field of theory of fiction, uh, including the area of adaptation of the novel to film, drama and theater uh, and cultural studies at the University of Amsterdam. Um, it was a Tempus project, European Institute of Gender Study in Florence, a summer school devoted to the problems of boundaries and borders. Uh, Université de la Sorbonne Nouvelle, Paris 3, a high educational support project. Erasmus visiting scholar at Eberhard Karls Universität, uh, Tübingen, Germany. Erasmus Mundus Crossways in uh, Cultural Narratives. Also, Slavica was an active participant in many seminars and conferences focused on the problems of comparative studies, theory and history of literature and cultural studies. And today, uh, Slavica Srbinowska presents us a speech titled Understanding the Trauma of Disease through the film Variola Vera by Goran. Markovic, please. Thank you. What does it mean to create uh, the present to the prism of the past? This essay studies the 1972 smallpox outbreak in the former Yugoslavia, as represented in the film Variola Vera, produced in 1982 by director Goran Markovic. In telling the story of patients and medical staff in a hospital in Belgrade during the variola vera epidemic against the backdrop of socialist Yugoslavia, the film narrates and not only represents a specific historical period. Also, uh, it reframes the understanding of individual and collective trauma. The narrative is one of detection the problems marked by silence and detection, combined with, with, um, with an ambience of certain repressive social policies. The drama of the events, of the threat of epidemic and the collective and individual reactions that the film narrates are the experiences through which we understand and interpret the present. Richard Terdiman once remarked that memory makes history 
through an actual and essential influence in the contemporary cultural context. This reading of Ariola Vera in the context of public discourse about the epidemic, both in the 1970s and now, complements Tedeman's remark by showing a film narration of traumatic episode uh, that uh, 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 that uh, film narrations of traumatic episodes can complicate the status of memory and thus also of history. Memory refers to the past and takes place in the present. At the same time, it implies work with action and interventions. Memory is a symbolic representation embedded in social activity. Memory means confronting many trauma-related interventions of social actors from the past. A study of memory must synthesize concerns around history, representation, and politics that motivate our work on recent traumas from disease, while at the same time understanding that, uh, understanding that such a synthesis is impossible. Memory connects the individual, shaped, and experienced side of the past with the collective, social, and constructive side, constructed side of our ties to the past. Individual and collective versions of the past define the identity or the problems of uh, who we were and who we are today. This study explored the relations of memory to the identity of actors in circumstances of epidemic threat. I start my explanation with a dialogue between the Dr. Gruich, one of the persons in the movie, who says, here it comes. The salesman asks, who? The doctor replies, the black lady. Immediately afterwards, he asks the seller, if he had the book by Albert Camus entitled The Plague. The seller, the seller replies that he does not have it, but he has the book that lurks. Memory and history are closely correlated with the idea of identity. According uh, to, uh, to the study of uh, La Capra devoted to trauma, Memory and history also, also actualize the relations between the past and the present. Still, in dialogue with them, the issue of trauma and addi is additionally actualized. Often, the traumatic memor memories and the opposition to the post-traumatic effects have a corrective impact on the written documents. The transfer of traumatic experiences from generation to generation concerns both those who cause it, the perpetrators of the trauma, and those who sur survive it. In situations where memory is the subject of observation, paying attention to the difference between individual and collective memory is significant. They are in confrontation like the oral and written versions of the presented event collide. Memory and oral narration, explains Jacques Derrida, are often put in the background at the expense of written documentation. Still historical and social contexts allow us to discuss oral narration and the role of memory in this kind of experience. All affective states through which events play out and result in trauma are essentially states followed by post-traumatic effects, such as compulsive repetition, increased anxiety, nightmares, and insomnia. Trauma and the consequences of trauma become an integral part of building genealogies and uh, knowledge about specific historical periods with a crucial role in memory and oral expressions. Illnesses are traumatic experiences, especially if they involve the limitation caused by the condition of illness and other under the threat of infection and the danger of a high degree of risk and death. 
The memory is such situation affected by the illness involves the limitation or distortion of the national team. In the spirit of this reflection, Wittgenstein's indication that there are events about which we cannot speak, just that there are events that we cannot be kept silent, is significant. However, silence can also talk in their own way. Uh, silences can also talk in their own vein, having a performative dimension that is not devoid of objective meaning and moral force. The very breaks or gaps uh, uh, in testimony can refer to disruptive experiences and the relieving of trauma that activates the past in the present, making it seem or feel real with the gift with the gift of contemporary circumstances. Memory's role is significant in traumatic and post-traumatic experiencing, experiences reviving the trauma. Still at the same time, it creates a distance between the active traumatic experience. Still it makes a difference between the event that caused that experience. It is not part of the experiences that appear again in the present. The uh, inexpressibility or inability to talk about the traumatic events is associated with states of melancholy, and endless sadness, or so-called Lacan's non-symbolic real. For events that cause trauma, such as the Didi's Variola Vera, which is the story presented in the film of the director Goran Markovic from 1982, and which are actually in, histori histori in historiography too, with a discourse that insists on objectivity, on facts, on balance in the statement, trauma makes difficulties during the uh, procedures, procedures of non-fictional narration. It prompts an investigation not codified by the approaches of traditional historiography, but by the art of narration with moving images. Jacques Derrida relies on what he calls ontology, which is often related to the influences of the past on the present. Nicholas Abraham elaborates the same idea of a transgenerational phantom and in that sense actualizes the suffering of the past that affects the present where the incorporated events of the past into a world of the unconscious, unrepressed, unconscious, that tends to become an object of interpretation. As a metaphor for that situation, the appearance of Hamlet's father's ghost, who was in a position commit a, to commit a secret crime, affects the, hans, the son's huntings. One elementary implication of this line of thinking is that the phantom or ghost understood and accepted as a metaphor or hallucination is a form of traumatic memory or post-traumatic effect. 51 years ago in 1972 in Yugoslavia, the country that uh, no longer exists, the last naturally occurring ep epidemic in Europe appeared, smallpox or variola vera. An article from the Serbian newspaper Danas entitled Yugoslavia in 1972, in a record time it vaccinated 18 million people by the journalist Hadjovic and published in August of uh, 20, uh, 2021, remembers the epidemic of variola vera affecting socialist Yugoslavia driven by living conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic between March 15, 2020 and 2021. Before we return to the current, uh, to the content of the article that analyzes the epidemic uh, from the perspective of the 21st century and in the context of a new pandemic, it is essential to note that the very phenomenon of the pandemic actualized the issues related to the state, the health system, science, the financial means available for providing 
vaccines, as well as life under quarantine conditions. The epidemic first appeared on the territory of Kosovo and in Belgrade. Patient zero is, through, is thought to be a man named Ibrahim Hoti, an Albanian citizen of Yugoslavia, from the village near Djakovica, who had been on a pilgrimage to Mecca. He had traveled by bus and before leaving had taken the vaccine against variola vera. Several doctor, doctors believed that he had wiped the vaccination site with alcohol and uh, thus reduced the effect of the vaccine. He returned home on February 15, 1972 and felt body edges and fatigue but attributed this to the bus journey. On March 3rd, on 3rd March, another man from the same village known by the name Mimidic, contacted the, contracted the virus. He had not been in direct contact with Hoti, but was in touch with people who had contact with him. The doctors attempted to treat Mimidic at the local medical center with, not, with uh, no success. Because they did not have the diagnosis, they treated the patient with the antibiotic penicillin. His condition did not improve, and uh, he was transferred to another more prominent medical center in Chachak, and then to Belgrade. The medical student analyzed the, 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 his body as an example of a patient with typical reactions to penicillin. The next day, he suffered massive internal bleeding and died. For the doctors, the bleeding was a reaction to the penicillin, but it, was essential, but it was essentially the result of the variola vera that they had not discovered recently. During his illness, Mimijic infected 38 medical personnel, eight of whom died, and a few days after his death, 140 cases of smallpox appeared in Kosovo. The disease, the disease spread to 175 people and 35 died. We use the journalistic article that uh, positively evaluates all the activities undertaken at that time in the 1970s and the journalist Hadjic writes about them from the perspective of the 21st century and in the context of the developments of the COVID-19 pandemic. According to Hadjic, the government at that time reacted quickly and efficiently by closing the places where there were infected uh, cases of people with barbed wire, banning uh, public gatherings, closing the borders, and allowing travel only in exceptional circumstances. The government decided to accommodate 10,000 people in hotels, as it supposed that those people had been in contact with the infected. The military and the police detained and guarded the people in the hotels. Revaccination began with the help of the World Health Organization. Soon thereafter, the smallpox specialist Donald Henderson arrived in Yugoslavia. The medical special, uh, specialist controlled the whole situation. Within two months, the epidemic stopped and the situation returned to normal. A report from BBC Serbia by journalist Aleksandar Miladinović, dated April 30, 2020, lists the memory of several people who witnessed the events related to the variola vera virus disease in March and April 1972, known to have been eradicated. Still, it is also known to be a highly fatal disease. In an article for BBC Serbia about the smallpox epidemic in the Socialist uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Dula Loshons, a student at the secondary medical school in 1972, 
commented that the police and the army controlled the movement of people. Namely, the police and the military prohibited the movements of non-vaccinated people. And the police and the army were at the work at the exits and entrances to the cities. At the same time, there was a control of people's vaccination certificates at the railway and bus stations. Epidemiologist Zoran Rodovanovich, who organized and implemented the procedures for protection and vaccination, comments on the simple name of the uh, disease, but also uh, uh, its deadly consequences, namely the variola vera epidemic, has killed the most significant percent of the infected population in the history of civilization. That is about 30% of the affected population. The journalist from the BBC speaks by interviewing people who, through their memories, verbally express and positively value the state's control of epidemic. The epidemic ended on May 19, when the last patient left the hospital. According to Radovanovich, Yugoslavia managed to deal with the epidemic with 35 causalities. Jelena Miović adds that further success was achieved in developing awareness among people about hygiene condition. Under circumstances in which the system works well, a strategic response can develop quickly, say, says Radovanović, and with the understanding that there is no room for mistakes, the protection against the epidemic was, was successfully implemented. Among the measures taken was uh, wearing of masks, then the limited movement on people, and finally with coordination, vaccination, uh, with coordinated vaccination efforts. Goran Markovic from Variola Vera, it's a story based on actual events. Still as a fiction, it, force, it focuses on the relationship of institution in the conditions of an epidemic by including the private life situation of the actors with all the restrictions associated with status or class, gender, and profession. In telling a story of the constant struggle between life and death, the film represents both individual and deep institutional dramas. In the social circumstances of socialist Yugoslavia, with one party system in which the critical pillars of the state are the military and the police, the choice to exit the prescribed procedures simply does not exist. The hospital is a stem of infection with variola vera. There is no, no possibility for anyone found in the ward with the infection to find a way out of that situation. The hospital turns into a scene of a conflict between characters, and this uh, microhistorical context uh, in which the problems of, of infected or no infected, just suspected patients as ordinary people anticipate the big picture of social and historical circumstances. As a fictional text, the film provides content that is, this particular case is not based on unexpected or imaginary terrifying circumstances in which infection by viruses, bacteria, or unknown agents destroy humanity. The film results from the author's effort to provoke interpretations of culture in which the topic of viruses, such as variola vera, reveals new layers of the meaning related to the social context. In this film, we are not talking about a narrative that metaphorically actualizes the events that once happened. That is, it makes a reminiscence of the uh, dangers of disaster that have already played out and announces future potential accidents and threats to the survival of humanity. In an era of environmental, biological, nuclear, and other threats, the epidemic um, uh, film communicates the fears that wait on people. 
memory focuses on virus outbreaks that uh, were known or undetected to, uh, throughout the film narratives creates an image of people living in contemporary culture under the threat of catastrophic consequences resulting from viruses eradicated in the period of a great ecological catastrophe. Films such as Outbreak, Doomsday, uh, uh, Contagion and Pandemic problematize both the issue of disease and the issue of society that is sick and has the potential to deal with the pandemic or collapse under the pressure of the threat of disease spread. In that sense, the disease variola vera or the situation related to the last naturally occurring epidemic in Europe through the prism of the film gives a much broader picture of the social and cultural circumstances in which the emphasis is not only on the epidemic but on the way it works or is in crisis and the society itself is entirely, is entirely dysfunctional. As examples of this kind, the study will mention The Last of Us series, directed by Greg Mazin and Neil Drakman, and the Silo series, produced by Graham Yost. Their series correspond more to the dystopian or apocalyptic narrative genres. In contrast, the film Variola Vera, based on actual events, corresponds as much to the horror genre as the cinema with the theme of infection disease or films that in the theory of popular culture, culture are called movies about apocalyptic events. How does this film as a technology of, me as a technology of memory helps us remember the epidemic and frame our understanding of the present? Critics have largely understood this film as a product of its socialist era and have neglected to examine the thematic, formal, and theoretical relationship between the historical moment constituted in part by the film and the present historical moment. In the discursive space of the former Yugoslavia, film critics have paid special attention to the film uh, narratives as a type of culture that, that influences the attitude of building towards the values of life. Much of the criticism of historians, especially those dealing with the history analysis from below, like the historian Radina Vucetic, the smallpox epidemic in Yugoslavia, on which she writes in The Invisible Enemy, Variola Vera, 1972, uh, or criticism like that of Marina Mandic, uh, permitted between the real and the imaginary, rest their readings of the film on the belief that the director and, the, and his family had to follow the party line and could therefore not criticize the government for its misleads. Uh, this radical proclamation of the punishment of artists, especially in the film industry or the arts, the need for self-censorship in expression seems dependent mainly on political attitudes and conviction that the social system in socialist Yugoslavia is authoritarian and excludes individual opinion or criticism. According to Vucetic's complaint through the story of disease in the film, the contemporary recipients reflected the image of the social system in the society. Namely, the epidemic is a symbol for expressing the porosity and decay of the system, which is an oppressive system for ordinary people. In 2016, Goran Markovic, speaking about the film Variola Vera in the platform portal Periscope, several decades after filming, believes that the film uh, with its focus on the epidemic, actually heralded the breakup of Yugoslavia, the beginnings of the end destruction of ex-Yugoslavia. According to his interpretation, considered to appear in 1968 with the student protests against Josip Broz, 
than with the first terrorist attacked in the October 20 cinema and intensified in the years after Tito's death. This essay offers an alternative reading of the film and suggests that we can understand it not so much as an index of the historical moment, but, but as a technology that mediates between the trauma of the past epidemic and the trauma of the present pandemic. The action in the film focused on preventing the spread of the epidemic in Belgrade uh, takes place uh, uh, in the General Hospital in Belgrade with the presentation of the health conditions, uh, the treatment, the care of the sick, the level of expertise of the staff, the impact of the employment policy in the hospital. The generational relationship between the professionals, the health work, workers, as well as the personal dramas in the lives of the characters, especially the complex interpersonal relationships, uh, makes this film very uh, significant. The film shows the death of the first patient, Rejepi, from the infection disease he transmitted after the pilgrimage through the flute. The establishment of the quarantine in the hospital uh, the reorganization and vaccination of the patients and the involvement of the medical staff in the disposal of the personal belongings of the patients, among others, the objects are the funeral, through to which the first sick and diseased patient gets the disease from the man who sells it to him. However, that flute remains wholly preserved and someone pulls it out of the flames where the rest of the objects are burning. In the film story, but uh, we can see in this shoot, in the film story, the viewers watch the circumstances of an epidemic, the involvement of a state authorities in the con containment of contagion, the control of information, and the measures taken by the hospital staff with all the dramatic relationship between them when the contagion spreads both among patients and among uh, teams in the hospital. The film's end represents the defeat of the infection. A new headquarters, we can see him, is in the hospital and the head of the new management declares victory over the epidemic. But at the exact moment, he holds the flute in the hands. Thank you. Thank you, Slavica. And now I would like to give uh, the voice to the next uh, panelist, uh, Dorota Sosnowska, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Institute of Polish Culture uh, uh, Department of Theater and Performance at University of Warsaw. She is the author of the book about three actresses uh, of the communist period in Poland, entitled uh, Królowe PRL, Sceniczne Wizerunki Ireny Eichlerówny, Niny Andrycz i Elżbiety Barczewskiej jako modele kobiecości, uh, published in 2014. She took part in the scientific projects devoted to the problem of performance documentation, uh, theoretical status of sources, archives and documents in performance studies, sources and meditations, and performance and memory, performing memory. She published articles on the subject in Polish and international journals such as Performance Research or Maska, and co-edited a book devoted to the memory of workers, theater, robotnik, uh, performance, pamięci, published in 2017. Uh, now Dorota uh, is working as principal investigator on the project Odmieńce Performa Performances of Otherness in Polish Transition Culture and uh, co-investigator in the project uh, titled Epidemics and Communities in Critical Theories, Artistic 
practices and speculative fabulation of last decades. Both uh, of these projects uh, is obviously financed from the Polish National Science Center. Uh, and uh, she is a member of editorial board of the VIEW Theories and Practices of Visual Culture Journal. Dorota, please. The floor Thank is yours. Um, yeah. So, um, not entirely well remembering HIV AIDS in contemporary Polish art. <laughs> um, it is commonly thought in Poland that AIDS epidemic didn't really happen in our country. Uh, as Jakub Janiszewski shows in his 2013 book, Kto w Polsce ma HIV, Epidemia i Mystificacje, who has HIV in Poland, Epidemic and its Mystifications, AIDS was and is something rather collect collectively unlived. Uh, from the very be beginning, it was defined as non-existent or successfully beaten. No important, well-known, recognized or celebrated person died of AIDS in Poland. The country was spared the epidemic according to government agencies and the Ministry of Health. Although it is obviously not true, in the similar vein, Lucia Ivanceska writes about culture dimension of HIV AIDS experience in her recent book, Potencjalności Transformacji, Potentialities of Transition, uh, short uh, lasting of the cultural performances of the 90s in Poland. She states that the moral and religious discourse Thank you. Weakened or even annihilated the emancipatory potential of the epidemic that allowed the formation of strong political movement in the West. She writes, however, the story of AIDS in Poland does not continue. The traces are of ruptures in the social body led nowhere. As a society, we have learned nothing about ourselves permanently. I argue that this conviction works also like criticized discourses towards covering rather than discovering the impact of the epidemic in Poland as it ignores the different experiences depending on different positions in the AIDS history and crucially for this talk, the role of memory. In order to see how generational memory of AIDS is actually still present, I propose to analyze two connected artistic events. Uh, the exhibition Power of Secrets by Karol Radziszewski, shown in Ujazdowski Castle in Warsaw, and entitled Together Again, performance by Michał Borczuch, produced in Hau in Berlin, and shown also in Ujazdowski. Both took place in November 2019. Exhibition lasted till March 2020, just before the COVID-19 outbreak. The poster advertising the exhibition was a striking image. It was composed of the word AIDS written with letters from a Donald Duck alphabet sticker set. Multiplied, it became kind of pattern-like on the fabric. The tension between childish funny letters and the word itself, bearing the weight of illness, death, politics, and art history, is what in my opinion marks the generational AIDS memory I'm interested in. Radziszewski is one of the most renowned queer Polish artist. He is also a founder of the para institution called Queer Archives Institute, which gathers documents of the lives of excluded or living in secret communities, mostly from Eastern European countries. At the heart of this collection are the Richard Kiesel's archives. Kiesel is an activist and founder of Philo, a gay magazine which first appeared on the underground scene in the 1980s. He is also the creator of the Donald Duck AIDS composition, first printed in Philo in 1999 and then reused and multiplied by Radziszewski for the first time in 2012 as a series of silk screens referring to general ideas travesty of Robert Indiana's love. The power of this artistic gesture lies not only in the original, playful and provoking idea of contrasting a fatal, sexually transmitted illness with childish stickers connoting innocence and naivety, but also in the time gap that divides those two moments, the time of democratic transition in Poland. The Donald Duck stickers also connote Western imagery, framing the understanding of AIDS in Poland as well as the desires and imageries of transition. Uh, 
This connection between AIDS and transition signaled by the poster and tapestry work covering one of the exhibition walls was further reinforced by the power of secrets construction, where Radiszewski's work works became a backdrop for pieces by other artists like Wolfgang Tillmans, Natalia Lel, General Idea, and Richard Kiesel himself. The most important part of the show was Kiesel's archive mentioned above, which framed other works as referring to the past and its experience. The first room gave the whole uh, project the most personal meaning. Entitled 1989, fairy tale sketches from Radziszewski's school notebook were enlarged and painted on the wall. As stated in the exhibition leaflet, at the turn of 1989 and 1990, the artist was nine years old and was not entirely aware of the transition shaping the new Polish reality at that time. The fall, of, the fall of socialism, the budding capitalism, and the abrupt development of consumerist culture on the one hand and on the other abducted princesses, good fairies, and sexy temptresses, the program said. On the, wall, on the next wall, those fairy tale images are accompanied by the photo series Barbie. You, I didn't find the image, so you can only see how it was placed on the, on the wall. Uh, those little posters are the, uh, the Barbie series photos. Uh, also from 1989, enhanced and professionally printed in 2019, depicting boys' games with plastic dolls. In the background, a 1990s reality looms in the form of curtain, lamp or desk, creating a sensual experience for all those who lived through this period, bringing to mind a concept of memory coined by Polish essayist Olga Drenda. In her book entitled Tuchologia Polska, Rzeczy i Ludzie w Latach Transformacji, Polish Hauntology, Things and People in Times of Transition, she writes, I realized that memories from the 80s and 90s are full of disruptions. It is, of course, the nature to be prone to falsifications and misdirections. But why, the generation, but why in the generational memory can one find so much technology-driven terror? Is it because we remember this through an image full of ghosts, after images, dualities, as in a Rubin television set, the old Russian brand of television, prone to implosion? The end of quotation. To name this specific kind of memory, Drenda refers to Jacques Derrida's hauntology and uses this term to describe a memory that is, I uh, quoting, blurred hunting, mutated and deformed by the pressure of the layers of information. She is especially interested in the places where realities clash. She describes a photo of a girl dressed in jeans, walking with her child in a stroller on the crooked pavement. The girl stops in front of the music shop, Pop Magic, and she writes, Pop Magic! In this grim circumstance of holes in the walls, failing plaster, torn threshold, decay, end of quotation. Hauntology as a formula for describing the memories of the Polish transition is trying to frame this interference of different layers of reality depicted in the photo. The old and the new, the totalitarian and the liberal, and the cons communist and the capitalist orders which infiltrate one another. What we remember as the beginning of freedom and democracy is haunted by the uncomfortable after images and blurs hiding the material setting of the transition process. Things, spaces and bodies dismissed by the new definitions of citizenship, personhood, individualism and community still influence and interfere with the generational memory of transition. What is particularly interesting in Drenda's concept is that Polish hauntology, as she names this memorial flow, cannot be thought without things. Photos, furniture, old curtains hanging in the shop entrance, those are the triggers of memories somehow disturbed and disrupted. Although the connection between memory and things is, of course, a phenomenon widely described and studied at least from Bergson's Matter and Memory, it should be pointed out that an interesting transposition appears in this more literally rather than philosophical concept coined by Drenda. 
The relation between memory and things should be read in the context of the social, political and economic system providing the very definition of things and materiality. In this particular case, the definition is unstable, fluctuating, causing an interference, associating things with terror and pleasure at the very same time. This is a visible mark of the cognitive crisis that shaped the experience of the Polish 90s. In light of Radziszewski's exhibition, this crisis is caused not only by political and economic changes, but also and maybe even primarily by, by the unconsciously but intensely experienced epidemic of AIDS. Intentionally planned uh, to fall one day after the Power of Secrets opening, visitors to uh, Ujazdowski Castle could also attend a performance by Polish theatre director Michał Borczuk, the last of the three evening sets. The titled Untitled, Together Again, the performance is a kind of, kind of tribute to the AIDS-related art of Felix Gonzalez, Gonzalez Torres, imitating his way of entitling works. Borczuk, together with choreographers and dancers, Ania Nowak, Paweł Sakowicz, and actress Dominika Biernat, first prepared the performance for the Berlin Theatre How Hebel am Ufer, for the Present is Not Enough, performing Queer Histories and Futures Festival in June 2019. Three people on stage take different sexually charged poses in changing configurations. Anya presses her head into Dominica's chest in the gesture of caressing her breast. Dominica kneels in front of Anya. Those photos are not related <laughs> to the things I'm reading. The Dominica kneels in front of Anya with her head between her legs. Pavel rhythmically wraps his bottom against Anya's bottom, both uh, kneeling. This strange and beautiful dance held in the lazy rhythm of music and a luminous pendulum moving at the back of the stage creates an atmosphere of closeness and intimacy. At the same time, they tell stories beginning with childhood memories, first love and first queer sexual experiences in the Polish 1990s landscape. In a story told by Dominika, AIDS appears as an image she prepared for a school competition. She fucked up the spelling, like she says, and wrote Addis instead of AIDS, which resulted in the work's rejection. Anya remembers watching a Wembley concert in memory of Freddie Mercury on TV. Pavel tells a story about his journey through fields to meet his first lover. The field changes into a jungle with a hairy monkey spitting into the ground. And it all begins, he says. The performance narration ends with the suicide of Milo, who, as a transgendered person, unable to live in conservative, Catholic, and more and more undemocratic Polish society, jumped for the bridge in Warsaw in May 2019. It is hatred more than the disease which kills people. But in the 1990s, the fear of death was not real. The changing reality was not real either. AIDS and transition, as words heard on TV, in school, from adults talking, somehow bland, producing this strange constellation in which the deadly disease coming from the West is indiscriminable from Western goods, pop culture, and changing words. As a result, both symbolize desire and fascination, as well as fear and a sense of for foreigners. As clearly seen from the unobvious perspective of the queer community's experience in Radziszewski's and Borchuk's works, the communal, unofficial, and intimate memory of transition is infected with AIDS. To grasp the way generational memory of HIV AIDS works in those artistic examples, I propose to use the category of transitional images coined by Polish memory studies scholar Katarzyna Bojarska in context of Wilhelm Sassner's paintings. In her text, Wilhelm Sassner's transitional images, she recounts the predilection of Polish visual arts to respond to, I quote, a changing memory culture shaped by shape in the aftermath of the political and social transformation of, the, of 1989. Art's potential for addressing the most troubling, co contested and painful elements of collective identity seems unique. End of quotation. Sasnal Mao's cycle from 2001 is a response to a crisis triggered by publication of the Art Spiegel Spiegelman's graphic novel in Polish. Mao's 
you probably all know this, 1986 tells the story of its author's parents who survived the Holocaust. The characters are depicted as animals. Jews are, are mice, Germans are cats, and Poles are pigs, the Americans dogs. In the novel, Poles approach to Jews during the Second World War and the issue of Polish antisemitism appear very differently from the mainstream domestic narrative in which only the story of Poles' heroism and their rescuing of Jews from ghettos and camps is presented. Boyarska sees the publication of Maus among a series of so-called narrative shocks, according to the term memory researcher Elżbieta Janicka and literary historian Tomasz Żukowski had used to mark grappling that took place during the transition with collective memory and the political discourse of the community. Sosnal's paintings depicting scenes from the novel that are differently refoc refocused on the collective shame brought by pigs and especially the figure of Schmalzownik are transitional images in that sense that they that like the transitional objects in Donald Winnicott's theory of child development by surviving destruction, crisis, they enable shared reality, establishing new kind of communal relations. As Boyarska states, a transitional image could first of all provide an occasion for coming to terms with the world outside fantasy, the world of unwanted historical knowledge. These paintings do not show reality as it was or is, nor do they demand a recognition of facts, nor do they impose any kind of knowledge. Rather, as quite obscure image objects, they can take in a range, frustration, rage, frustration, and anxiety. They can be rejected and destroyed, censored and denied, yet the more the collective subject destroys them, the more they become real, and as such impossible to ignore, and as such objects for use." End of quotation. Transposing this idea onto transitional images of HIV AIDS, I propose to see Radziszewski's and Borchuk's work as dealing with not so much fantasy and unwanted historical knowledge, but rather child's unawareness of the meaning of the lived through experience. As transitional images, they take in the anxiety, but also excitement, strongly contradicted dictatory feelings shaping the sexual identity maturing in the times of HIV AIDS epidemic. As such, they also produce new communal ties around the generational experience that is in fact unspoken of, unconscious, and possible to see as such mainly from the queer perspective intimately connected to the embodied character of AIDS stigma. Transitional images as transitional objects share the haunted character of the things described by Drenda. They introduce disruption and interference in the common memory of the time of transition that appears as experience into, into not fully aware manner. In that sense, HIV AIDS epidemic and the way it functioned as constantly present but not addressed becomes central to understanding of the whole period and the way it still haunts the present. It is not marginal, nor not continued, not, nor not lived through. Quite the other way, HIV AIDS epidemic is what shaped the transition in Poland and remains to be narrated as such. Thank you. Dorota, very much. Uh, I appreciate your perfect timing. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, let's jump into the next uh, paper. Uh, let me introduce you Katarzyna Szarla, who is a PhD student in the Department of History at the University of Warsaw, working uh, recently or for some, at the moment, yeah, at the moment. <laughs> yeah, at her uh, PhD dissertation on the socio-cultural history of HIV slash AIDS in Poland in the 80s and 90s. She holds a degree in medicine from the Medical University of Warsaw, congratulations, and studied history and bioethics at the University of Warsaw. Her research interests include medical humanities, film and visual culture as a historical source or, and oral history. 
and she will present uh, a paper titled But Together with Our Dead, The Complexities of Polish HIV AIDS Memory. Please. Thank you to meet you all and uh, discuss my work with you. Uh, this presentation is on the margins of my uh, PhD dissertation that my research is mostly in practices of uh, being sick and resilient to sick role uh, in the 80s and 90s. And um, let's start um, with uh, one clarifying remark. Regarding HIV, Poland is a low prevalence country with stable epidemiological situation. As for the start of the recordings of National AIDS Center agenda of Ministry of Health, uh, from 1985 uh, until uh, last year, a total of less than 30,000 HIV infections was detected in Poland. Uh, the natural dynamics of Polish HIV AIDS epidemics at least two faced uh, as the second part of the 1990s is associated with the introduction and spread of highly active retroviral treatment uh, in one country and after an one after another. Uh, the medication regime that radically changed the prognosis of patients and is associated with the transformation of AIDS from the lethal disease to the chronic disease. Uh, and this is associated with gradual decrease in the visibility of HIV AIDS in public space. And my research and this presentation focuses on this first phase uh, from 1985 to 1999. Uh, so let's move to my title. Uh, the 1990s, especially the last years, were an important moments of national public debate in Poland, on Poland's place in the world especially due to entering distractions of the European Union, Poland's place in Europe and uh, shifts on a scale between what was considered the West and the East. And Maria Janion in the book To Europe, yes, but together with our dead, a collection of essays and interviews focused on the process of disintegration of the current cultural paradigm. Whether our debt uh, that we need to take to Europe with us uh, the, our debts in the Yanyan's work are mostly uh, primarily Jews, yet on a more general level. She emphasizes the need to, for attention of cultural contact uh, with the dead and the practices of mem remembering, especially those of our dead uh, that share the troubling status of being recognized as the other. And one of the most visible others of the 1990s are people suffering from HIV. AIDS. Uh, so the aim of my presentation is to look into some com of the complexities of Polish HIV AIDS memory. Uh, firstly, I will look into the specificity of AIDS uh, memory in Poland and outline the possible reasons that AIDS story is considered, as uh, Dorota uh, stated, uh, thank you very much before me, uh, that is unlived, repressed, uh, unremembered uh, and tends to be said by some groups in a conspiracy of silence narratives. And then I will focus on uh, the main part of my presentation that is remembrance of the dead as an present unpresent narrative in the local HIV story. Uh, the sources I investigate uh, include among other mostly ego documents, the oral history interviews, memoirs and essays. Uh, the memory of HIV AIDS epidemic is strongly influenced by the discourse about epidemics in the Western countries, I agree. While the experience of Central and Eastern European countries seems to be quite different, as we all know, uh, the history of HIV AIDS in Poland is then intertwined with the political, economic and cultural changes taking place during the period. At the beginning of HIV epidemic 1980s, Poland being part of the Eastern Bloc was partially isolated from the HIV crisis in Western countries, uh, experiencing it in a different way due to, among others, insufficiency of disintegrating state institution, while the socialist state uh, tried to control and limit self-organizing from below. The 1990s brought the political, economical, and cultural changes to the society that deeply marked the history of HIV epidemic in post-socialist countries, uh, this context that is not represented in a Western memory. Uh, 
Throughout Central and Eastern Europe, the unexpected and irrevocable fall of social regimes that began in the late, in, late 1980s presented enormous challenges uh, in the spheres of politics, society, as well at the level of individual experience. Excitement, uncertainty, fear, uh, or uh, outcomes um, in, in the, some kind of uh, thick times, as, as, is, as it was uh, uh, named by Justyna Struzik. Uh, the transformation is the crisis in itself, and HIV AIDS pandemic, epidemic is the times of transition, is the situation of the crisis within a crisis. Uh, this transformation had many layers and covered many key areas in the context of ongoing epidemic. Some of them obvious, of course, like turns in direction of health policies, openness to Western organization, and so on. What's more, the early 1990s, as we all know, are, were in parallel also the period of social unrest and protests, not only by workers, crew of transformed and closed factories, but also, for example, women's protests against the tightening of abortion law. Um, uh, what these tensions and uh, shifts between the what I call Western and Central European memories, I called them, I named them Philadelphia Memory and Time for Witness Memory. Uh, these are two films that premiered in a period of two months, actually, and uh, represent uh, different uh, stories uh, of uh, HIV AIDS epidemic, and um, after this period of high visibility, uh, regardless uh, of the local specificity, we, uh, we had this huge influx of westernized images and narratives uh, that were established in a different context, and then after this hot uh, for HIV uh, AIDS um, moment in the 1990s, we had uh, a dozen uh, of so years of significant, significant reduction of uh, HIV AIDS visibility in a public sphere. Beyond the taboo surrounding HIV AIDS as, as uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, one may point at least, um, I would say, uh, at least three layers, three factors that influence this uh, emerging narratives of unlived AIDS, of repressed AIDS. So the first is what I started from, are the numbers. Uh, is the HIV AIDS epidemic in Poland an epidemic? Uh, although um, lots of people were immersed in this hot uh, HIV AIDS debate, uh, lots of narratives about drug addiction, um, sex education, and so on. Not so many people really experienced the long-lasting relationships with the people which were HIV+. Plus. So when the discourse were not so um, HIV-obsessed, then their interest in, in, a, uh, in a topic just um, disconnected from it. Uh, it was also a period of uh, w what Justin Astrogi called thick times, that is the huge intensity of political and social events in the 1980s and 1990s that were actually uh, to be remembered. And we also, and the HIV AIDS epidemic actually t struck the, um, some uh, groups such as LGBT plus uh, uh, movement in a different moment uh, of their organization at a different stage. And uh, actually in the recent years we observed the building memory of, uh, of these uh, groups on HIV. So uh, we have some kind of tensions between the so-called gay HIV, drug addict HIV, and uh, some kind of uh, looking for Polish Stonewall uh, in the Operation Hyacinth. So after this, uh, some years of lesser visibility, uh, the question is coming back, uh, uh, who has the HIV? And um, 
<coughs> as it was boldly stated uh, during the pandemics of COVID-19, but also before it, uh, it's an ongoing remembering of, uh, of uh, uh, this issue. Uh, Bartosz Rawiecki asked in replica uh, in article Polish AIDS victims, Polskie ofiary AIDS, uh, in June 2021, uh, how it is actually with this AIDS in Poland. And this article was actually an open call for regaining uh, the memory of Polish HIV AIDS, uh, and it expressed several times before in recent years. And uh, it was also taking into consideration the activities commemorating people who died in the West, with AIDS memorial among them. And uh, he called uh, the not commemorating Poland, the deafening silence on the subject in the Poland, uh, which is actually uh, puzzling. Um, so, um, it was also uh, said in all this context of COVID-19, but uh, do not, uh, I, I don't want to make an impression that it was COVID-19 that brought back the AIDS. It was kind of some years before, and it 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 was fueled, but uh, not it was not the most important issue. So uh, let's move uh, through all these uh, very interesting uh, actions to commemorate. For example, Rzewa Archiva and the uh, Pink Archives project by Polistrefa Foundation to remember uh, Hyacinth. Uh, the history of the politics in Milan and Warsaw, and uh, the very interesting uh, artistic research platform by Szymon Adamczak. And uh, as the one of the roots was named, actually, uh, for the friends we did not save. And uh, it, it's somehow connected with this idea that uh, uh, the queer people uh, have their fam families uh, among their friends, and these are the friends who are to remember them and to commemorate them. And uh, there was, it was also some kind of call for commemoration of the HIV victims. But let's move to uh, the main part of my presentation, which is the, uh, looking for the remembering uh, of HIV AIDS uh, uh, people who died uh, of HIV AIDS in the oral history archives in the memoirs, on the margins of remembering. And uh, some of the uh, uh, interviews I analyzed were published in Historia last year, edited by Justyna Struzik and Agata Dziuban. And uh, I searched for remembering and for strate strategies of remembering the people who died of AIDS. So we have uh, one of it is, uh, which I uh, which I show in this example by Wojciech Tomczyński, is some kind of uh, remembering unnamed people we met on a ward somewhere in a, our HIV plus journey. Um, it's, uh, it's the main narrative uh, connected to the 1980s. Uh, the young man who came uh, from abroad, from the United States, for example, who died uh, in, uh, in Poland, was unnamed, unknown, uh, all alone. There is also uh, the narrative uh, of uh, mothers, mostly, but also friends who commemorate their loved ones, and this is the reason to become activists, to become involved. And those are the people who, uh, who tend to uh, share the stories of the people who died of HIV AIDS. Uh, and there is also this um, initiative, which is AIDS Remembrance Day. And it's actually this, one, of this in, uh, one of these parts of global remembering HIV AIDS, that is uh, the day of remembering people uh, who died of HIV AIDS. But still, it's not the most present uh, part of the uh, remembering, commemorating HIV, people who died of HIV AIDS in Poland. And um, actually, uh, what Agata uh, Dziuban and Justyna Strozik um, 
uh, summarized uh, in their research, uh, this remembering is very scattered, and they, uh, they argue that there's a lack of common and social ways of experience mourning of HIV AIDS in Polish context. It's a very rooted in a private order, and uh, we also see some kind of strategies in oral history uh, research in our interviews that we do not really know if a person is remembering uh, a friend or it is some kind of strategy to cover their own memories. Like they say that they knew this kind of uh, motive that one friend of mine experienced something and so on. So uh, this, uh, in all these uh, interviews, it made, it is very rooted in a private order. And uh, let's return for a moment to this call for uh, remembering that was published in Replica in last year. Actually, this month, uh, it was, um, some of it were published by Bartosz Żurawiecki uh, in an essay, uh, Ojczyzna moja moralnie czysta, my fatherland morally clear. Um, and uh, he uh, actually does what he proposed uh, in, in this call for remembering. Um, he shares some stories, of course, that he found in, in press, in uh, reportages, and about uh, people, who, unnamed people who, uh, who died of HIV AIDS. But he also tries to name people. Like, for example, he, um, he, there's a part about Janusz Nyczak, who uh, died of AIDS uh, in 1990. Um, and what was noted and was very important that Janusz Nyczak publicly told his colleagues from Nowy, Nowy Theatre that he had AIDS and uh, he spoke about it openly. Uh, Bartosz Żurawiecki poses a very impo uh, important questions. Uh, when we call for remembering people who died of AIDS, actually we do, do not know many people who openly spoke that they have AIDS or, um, so it's uh, an ethical question when we, uh, when we regain, when people uh, call for regaining the memory of people who died of AIDS, uh, we also have to watch out for outing and bridging some borders of uh, intimacy and privacy that are connected with uh, individual decisions surrounding whether someone wants to speak openly about his or her uh, disease. So to sum up, um, what is very interesting at the moment, I would say that it's not only this memory flows that we see between this Philadelphia memory and uh, Time for Witches memory, uh, we also see the flows in the practices of remembrance and uh, this call for remembering is somehow influenced what, what is going on in the Western Europe, in the United States. Uh, we also see this as, as a part of building memory of, uh, within the identity policies. And uh, it's kind of thinking about that uh, dying of AIDS is, is a queer death uh, as a concept. We see this part of this narrative, for example, at the exhibition of uh, Kim Lee, Królowa Warszawy, Kim Lee, Queen of Warsaw, uh, that died of COVID-19, but AIDS was on the margins of this, of this exhibitions in the notes. Uh, we also have this, what uh, Dorota stated, this coming back of trans transformational uh, images and our remembering of the 1990s and the period of transformation that is, uh, that's more and more important and more and more returning in the public memory. And as remembering the Polish HIV AIDS memory, we have the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the memory. But as I stated, do not overestimate it, it, uh, its uh, importance because we had so we had so-called AIDS crisis revisitation uh, earlier, like a decade earlier. And uh, I think that this, uh, the surge in interest in HIV AIDS uh, epidemic after the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, it's interesting, but do not um, intertwine them too much. Thank you very much.
Katarzyna, uh, for your paper, and this is the time for the last speaker uh, in our panel, Evelina Spag, who you know already. Uh, she is a member of the ENRS academic section and associate professor at the Tadeusz Manteuffel Institute of History, Polish Academy of Sciences. She received her PhD degree from Jagiellonian University in Krakow in 2010. Uh, and since 2012, uh, she was principal investigator and participant of several research grants on social history of communist Poland funded by the Polish National o uh, Science Center. Uh, she is the author of four books on social and cultural history of post-war uh, Poland, including A Man is Sick When He is in Pain, A Sociocultural History of Health and Illness in the Polish Countryside after 1945, uh, published in 2018 and current, currently is working on her new book on social history of malignant tumors in post-war Poland. Um, except social history of medicine, her main fields of research are social history of post-war, provincial Poland, uh, history of mentality, memory studies, environmental history and history of biopolitics. And today she will present the Piper, uh, paper uh, Modern Lepers or Forgotten Patients, the conspiracy of silence surrounding the cancer sufferers in post-war Poland. The floor is yours. Am I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Konrad, for uh, this uh, kind uh, introduction and very long. Uh, so um, I hope that you are still you're, you still have the strength to listen to the fifth paper. I know it's a lot, so I try to be uh, not too long. So unlike my previous uh, speakers, I'm not going to talk about contagious disease, uh, about, about the disease that was perceived for, for several decades to be, to be contagious, and it had a great impact on so many aspects. So uh, I will start. In 90... Okay, so uh, how, sh how does it work? Let me show. Okay. Forward, backward. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so in, in 1971, a Polish publicist preparing study on oncology education, quite unique on, on the publishing market at that time, described attitude towards cancer in Poland as a conspiracy of silence. More than a decade later, one of the oncologists also stated, just as the, as the leper did centuries ago, today the cancer patient is avoided from afar. The family moves away. At work, they wonder how to get rid of the employee in a gentle way. The occupational health doctors know that the patient will admit to the stomach ulcer, to a heart disease, even to STD, so sexually transmitted diseases, but for nothing in the world to the fact that he has ever had anything to do with the Institute of, of Oncology. Caring for the mental health of, of oncology patients, Krakow psychologist Teresa Turek-Novakova, meanwhile added, when the word cancer is said, people start to whisper. Clear, clearly re reflected in all these accounts, the tension surrounding uh, the problem of cancer, which was growing in terms of mortality and morbidity, was uh, not a phenomenon unique to Poland only. Fears of this still at the time for many people, including experts, a mysterious disease and a kind of escape from talking about, uh, about it openly, both in the private space, so between family members, in the hospital space, so between doctors and patients, and in the public discourse were also observed in the other European countries, especially until 1960s. The aim of my presentation will be to show the causes and consequences of much longer conspiracy of silence surrounding cancer. In Poland, it has been prevalent, prevalent much longer than in Western countries and, uh, and has resulted in the social exclusion, avoidance, and sometimes even abandonment of cancer patients. And on the other hand, in the consolidation of their image in the social memory as hopeless cases condemned to death. In my analysis presented here very briefly for the reasons of time, I focus on an attempt to take a dynamic look at both expert and grassroots knowledge and the relation to each other or lack of thereof. 
Uh, at the same time, I attempt to set the analysis in the specific cultural and political context of post-war Poland. Uh, the visible tendency to make cancer a sort of taboo is a long-lasting phenomenon linked to beliefs about its causality, functioning in a popular collective imagination as partly permitting from expert discourses. As a mysterious disease for centuries in medical science with no clear explanation of, uh, of uh, the etiology, it has given rise to various theories which, when unconfirmed, were usually uh, quickly abandoned in the scientific world. However, scientific te thesis and pre-assumptions has often, to some extent, seeped into popular knowledge where they have persisted for much longer or evolved, uh, evolved over subsequent decades. The particular example of this was the theory of cancer contagiousness uh, that was challenged by science as early as the 17th century. Nevertheless, still in 18th and 19th centuries, many physicians in uh, practice believed in the possibility of cancer spreading in a way, in a manner analogous to infectious diseases. The characteristic image of cancer in that time, usually diagnosed in advanced stages and in external locations, evoked connotations with images of people affected by the French disease or leprosy, so distinct and frightening infectious diseases. Such people were stigmatized as potentially threatening or repulsive and isolated from the rest of society because, as German researcher Michael Stolberg, Stolberg has pointed out, the mere view of cancerous tumors in the opinion of societies of that time could also lead to fatal disease. Uh, the modern beliefs described by Stolberg, Stolberg about the potentially, uh, potentially contagious odor and infectious secretion of the sick resulted in their is isolation. People also believed in the simple heredity of the disease and the possibility of its passing from adults to children. This thinking was also the reason why in uh, uh, 1742 in, in France, in Reims, where the first hospital for cancer patients was established, local residents protested and mass terrified that their lives were, were threatened by cancerogenic air. Although the authorities initially ignored the protests and dismissed the complaints, uh, a few years later the hospital was nevertheless moved to, uh, to the outskirts of the city. When 240 years later, in 1981, in Poland, in Nowa Huta, near Kraków, an agreement was reached between the Hospicium Association of Friends of the Six and Nowa Huta Parish Priest to build in to build an inpatient hospice for cancer patients, the reaction of the local housing estate community was similar. As Halina Burtnowska, one of the pioneers of the Kraków Hospice Movement, pointed out in her account, the reactions of the residents of Nova Huta uh, were probably inspired by the activities of secret security services. However, given the range of the other social behaviors and practices toward cancer patients, it is difficult to locate the origins of these reactions solely in the context of political gains of the local authorities. Even if they did occur, they undoubtedly fell on the fertile gr ground market, uh, marked by the very slowly changing public knowledge and uh, perceptions of disease in Polish post-war society. Uh, Teresa Turuk Novakova, a psycho -oncologist, psycho oncologist who worked with patients uh, at the work, uh, uh, sorry, at the Kraków Institute of Oncology, which I evoked uh, earlier, in 1984, uh, reporting in a conversation with the editor of one, Poli one of Polish journals uh, called uh, Przekrój, on the, uh, when she reported about the extent of social uh, cancer phobia in the Polish People Republic, she, she recalled the example of one of her patients, a single woman who spent her treatment breaks of several days at the home of her sister who took care of her. As turned out, these days, rather than the respite from hospital uh, reality, were an additional torment for the patient. And to quote, her sister set aside a separate knife, spoon, fork, and plates for her. She was not allowed to use any other uh, cut cutlery uh, or utensils. She d disinfected the door knobs with spirits. She put special cups uh, on all the knobs from the taps. When a patient turned on the radio, the knobs were immediately whipped with spirit, but cancer cannot be infected. The beliefs held by the woman, by the woman about the infectiousness of cancer were, were not at all unusual. In post-war Poland in the 1960s, the perception of oncological disease as potentially contagious was shared by almost half of the population. In 1976, it was about 46% 40, of the whole population. 
in the non-hospital space, source, sources show that the isolation of patients was fueled not only by recurring beliefs about the infectiousness of the disease, but also about its narrowly defined heredity. As research carried out by Polish psychologists in the 1980s shows, this issue aroused extreme emotions among patients especially. The research showed that in the last decade of the Polish People's Republic, one, of the resp one, uh, one in three respondents was convinced of uh, the simple heredity of cancer. Such statistics undoubtedly influenced the perception of both the sick and recovered, as well as the relatives uh, by their immediate environment, so neighbors, the distant family. According to other uh, analysis carried out by employees of the Institute of Psychology, in the control group, the statement, I would not start a family with a person who used to have a cancer, was affirmatively signed uh, by as many as 35.6% of the respondents, while another 14.5% percent were also likely to share such an attitude and they answered rather yes. The fear of cancer patients and survivors uh, and the imagined contagiousness of cancer were obviously due to the low knowledge of the public resulting from poor health education in this area. Until, the least, uh, the, uh, uh, until at least the mid-1970s, public information on cancer was limited to a perfunctory information on the successes of Polish oncology and later on progress in building the uh, oncology infrastructure. Although professionals in the media stress the great importance of early diagnosis for a positive prognosis, knowledge of the sim symptoms of the disease was also uh, very poor in the society. In addition, a predominant number of general practitioners, physicians, at least until the mid-1980s, did not inform patients about their cancer, even if they suspected it, because they were convinced that the disease was incurable. The need to rationalize and understand a mysterious and cruel disease, as in the case of any obscure and uh, population-threatening dis disorders, which was brilliantly, uh, or diseases, which was brilliantly um, described by Charles Rosenberg on the example of the stages of development of an epidemic, as, uh, at the grassroots level uh, resulted in the appearance of several non-professional or let's say homegrown theories. From the 1960s onwards, it became increasingly common in Polish society to link cancer with phenomena associated with modernization of, of everyday life, such as urbanization and air, air, air pollution, chemicalization of agriculture and artificial fertil fertilizers, abortion or the spread of television. It was believed that, uh, that re radiation from transmitters is, is also harmful. But in addition to linking the causes of cancer to elements of modernity, until the end of the 20th century, it was still very common in the collective imaginations of, Poland, of, Pol of Poles to link the disease to the consequences of the wrong decisions and behavior of the sufferers themselves. What is very interesting, however, until the mid-1980s, the consequences of cigarette smoking, which was hugely popular in Poland, were very hardly mentioned. The linking of disease uh, occurrence, at, at least on the grassroots uh, level, the linking of disease occurrence to patient uh, responsibility was particularly important for women who developed breast cancer, breast cancer and cancer of uterus uh, and cervix. The localization of cancers in organs directly associated with sexuality has sometimes led to accusation of questionable mortality, uh, morality and uh, morality of the part of sufferers. Uh, and this, this thinking was also rooted in a distant past and uh, it was, uh, and it was um, um, evidenced by, for example, uh, Karen Nolte or Ilana Lowe research. Uh, it was very uh, popular um, pre-assumption in the 19th uh, century. Although in the 1970s, the discovery uh, of the HPV virus considered to be the culprit for part of women's cancer pulled the moral burden of, uh, of cancer off women's shoulders. In grassroots knowledge, the long persistence of old beliefs were, were, was, were, were still uh, observed. In, it was very, very long, as in uh, 2005, in an interview with Edita Zierkiewicz, Magdalena Salomon, a leader of Wrocław Amazon Club, uh, who was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1991, de uh, described them in this way. No. Um, in some circles, there is a persistent belief that women who have breast cancer have committed infidelity in marriage, she stated. As a result, they don't go to the doctor, women, 
because it will be an admission of guilt. People explain it this way. Uh, where did she get it? She must have afforded it. Therefore, when a woman finds out that she has a disease, she feels very humiliated because of the stupid recognition that breasts are related to sex in different ways. She feels the field impure. Described by the speaker, the shame resulting from the perception of cancer as a disease caused by a wrong or immoral behavior was intertwined with narratives focusing on the uh, patient's responsibility for the disease developing in his or her body. One of the, uh, on the one hand, the, these narratives supported slogan, uh, slogans dating back to the 1920s promoted by the League of Nations appointed commissions against cancer. The slogan, if detected early, cancer can be cured, as stated in Ilana Love recently at the level of simple reading amounted to a sense of guilt of, of, on the part of the patients when their disease was detected in a much more advanced state. On the other hand, in the era of rapidly developing psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis and personality theories, beliefs dating back to the anquity about the correlations of female usually, temperaments uh, with cancer incidents were revived. Although they were, uh, although they were uh, mostly treated with distance by expert circles, sometimes, as in the case of the concept of type C personality or, or so-called cancer personality, the, this was the concept introduced by Lydia Temoshok from the University of Maryland, the, this, concept, the, this concept penetrated the public discourse when uh, were they persisted for many decades. In 1979, Józef Bogusz, a surgeon from Kraków and a recognized authority in the medical community, community of matters of ethics, said that, in, said that, to quote, in my entire life, I have never told a single patient that they had cancer, and I don't think I would ever be able to say that. One of the oncologists with whom I spoke several months ago, describing his experiences in the 1970s, in turn stated, when another patient was called into the office, someone who was not, not the person called would come in and it would turn out that it was a family member, either wife, father or mother, and whisper, doctor, I am related or a wife, I have to pay two patient's cards, one for the patient and one f uh, is from the doctor because the doctor gave it to me in secret so that, God forbid, the patient would, would, f wouldn't find out, would find out. Well, in the Western medicine, particularly in the United States and United Kingdom, the uh, revolutions of the 1960s and 70s and the movement to recognize the rights of various minorities gave rise to the discourse of patients' rights resulting in le legal regulations. In communist Poland until the, until the 1990s, the patients formally remained fully dependent on the treating physician. The Act of Medical Profession from 1950, which was in force until 1997, did not provide for any regulations concerning the information of patients, uh, both with regard to diagnosis and the treatment process. And this is also a quote. It was customary for the patient to receive uh, only good news and favorable information to the extent determined uh, by the doctor was uh, passed on the family, uh, irrespective of the patient's wishes. The patient was not particularly informed about the oncological diagnosis for fear of negative emotional consequences for him and his relatives and consequently for the medical staff, end of quote. The persistent silence and whispering about, uh, the, about cancer extended, of course, not only into, into the space of the medical facility, but also into other spheres of the patient's life, who after leaving the hospital ward, but also after being cured, was often not informed about the diagnosis. In 1976, former patients of the Oncological Institute in Krakow, when asked by the same psycho-oncologist psycho about the experience of having had breast, breast or uterine cancers six or ten years earlier often questioned the veracity of the earlier diagnosis. The respondents did not believe in the possibility of a permanent cure for their cancer. The fact that they had survived for many years was explained by most of them with the assumption that the disease was not cancer. 
they accepted the possibility of mistake on the part of the doctors or the di or a diagnosis of a precancerous condition. This peculiar disappearance of cancer patients in the social space was also observed and reported by, by the volunteers of hospice movement. It, it developed quite dy dynamically in the 1980s. Volunteers repeatedly encountered attitudes of patients' relatives concealing from neighbors and the immediate environment and environment the real causes of the of a dying person's deteriorating health. Interestingly, tabooing strategies were also supported by state structures. Grassroots initiatives emerging locally from the second half of the 1970s to establish cancer education and pa patient support organizations, inclu including the first and modeled on American Reach to Recovery Movement women's organizations, were blocked at, at the formal legal level. Applications for registration of such associations were consistently rejected by the Ministry of Interior Affairs. And the deeper mental sources of the long tabooization or stigmatization of cancer can also be seen in the 1990s, when, in spite of the flourishing hospice uh, movement, the liberation of the possibility to set to set uh, up a patient's organizations and the much greater freedom of grassroots activities, it was still rare to publicly disclose and talk about the illness. The change could, not, could, could only be seen in the early years of the 21st century when the crisis situation in Polish onco oncology, which had been quite consistently neglected during the first 15 years of finally democratic transitioning Poland, generated a mass movement of activists people of culture, politicians, and celebrities who concerned about the further development of Polish oncology spoke more and more loudly about the experience of the illness and, the, and thus effectively, uh, first among the elites, and then further broke the conspiracy of silence accompanying the illness. While in the middle of the 1990s saw the appearance, of, uh, appearance on the Polish publishing market of the first still rare but no longer anonymized memoir of cancer patients, it was not until the first decade of 21st century that the rush of Polish pathobiographies bio, bio, began to appear, incorporating the patient's perspective and their individual stories into the broader social discourse. It is only this perspective that has made cancer not only present in the public space, but has also made it possible to disclose one's own illness more and more boldly and openly. It has also given a new impetus to health education by contributing to the emergence of uh, and dissemination of completely new narratives about cancer. Thank you. <laughs>
if there and and it's not I, I believe it's not a homophobic question basically but uh, in the first panel we spoke about some sort of a social forgetting but in if in the case of HIV AIDS epidemic can we co can 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 we say something can we suspect an act of some sort of uh, overtaking of memory from one group to another I, I believe I, I I believe it does, it's, it's not the first time you're 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 you're, you're hearing that. Yeah. start. <laughs> Just decide. <laughs> okay. So, um, if I will be mistaken, Kasia will correct me. <laughs> But yeah, um, so this is a very important issue. I, I did. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, this is of course a very interesting and important issue. So starting from a point of uh, arriving, of uh, HIV arriving in Poland, the, um, the fact, that, like we can of course discuss why there is this uh, scenario going on that the most of the transmission is going on through the blood and through the syringes. So it is attributed to drug uh, addicts, as, as they were called then. And this is the scenario that is characteristic for the whole Eastern Europe and Asia. Actually, it is called like that. This is a... a um, Eastern Europe Asian model of uh, HIV transmission. The Western model is um, through uh, gay sex and the sex, uh, men between men sex, and the uh, African model is heterosexual sex. So these are the models that are used in epidemiology actually to describe the different scenarios of transmission. And of course, we can wonder why it happens like that if you look at the statistics. The, that are describing not only Poland but also Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. They are all the same, like the, the sexual transmission doesn't exist at all. So you can have this assumption that something is going on there, that maybe this is the case of how the uh, disease was actually reported and narrated, not so much of the reality of transmission. And maybe... Um, from today's point of view, one of the uh, one of the way of thinking about it is that actually, Kotański was the, the Marek Kotański, so the founder of Monar. It's incorrect. Uh, it's there is no way to say it uh, uh, that to, to know that right now. Yes, because all the statistics are really compelling, and if you look at the year-to-year -year statistics, the drug addicts are the biggest group. Uh, reported. So this is a very hard history, as Kasia said, to uh, uh, unfold because it means that those people were tested and they were tested because Monar was the first organization to have tests in Poland and they were mass test, like mass testing their uh, patients. So they were just protecting their uh, network of houses with uh, with those tests and they were the like actually the first one to uh, to establish some activism around HIV AIDS so this is important in in it's it's no way to say from the epidemiological or medical point of view if this is correct or not but from the cultural standpoint let's say we can uh, we can say that this is the narrative and this is the way it unfolded in Poland also because of the particular um, particular attitude towards sexual transmission um, also that maybe the one Maybe this is also interesting that the first appointee of uh, Ministry of Health after 1989 when the new health system was established, the first appointee of uh, Health Ministry um, to represent HIV AIDS 
a problem, like let's say, was a priest. So this is this is what uh, what maybe uh, shed some light on on the way it circulated and how it was really perceived uh, as an ethical problem, not so much medical problem or political problem. Um, so this is the one thing. The other, if there is some retaking of memory, uh, actually I think it's the um, realization of the scenario. It's it's more like, um, in my personal opinion, what how how the what Kasia uh, showed how the HIV/AIDS is uh, commemorated now. It's more about uh, like having HIV AIDS realizing a scenario that it's supposed to realize because it happened like that in, that in the Western world. So now we want to have the same scenario kind of established in Poland and uh, as it is uh, closely related to emancipation, to political issue, to identity politics, if it unfolds in that way, uh, making with this re and like remembering, forgetting the other group that was really strongly influenced by, by the experience of HIV. This is how I would put it. <laughs> Okay, so I totally agree with you. Like, um, we have some numbers, we have some percentages. I, I, um, there are some different sources. Some, uh, some I would say that seventy percent plus, sometimes eighty percent is, yeah, seventy eighty. Uh, it depends on the source, and uh, but as uh, Dorota stated, and I totally agree. Uh, this is our critique of the source. Like, uh, who do we test it? Who did we test actually uh, at the time? And uh, especially in the um, groups uh, who, uh, who, where people had male-to-male um, -male, uh, sex, uh, there were at the beginning, especially in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there was some kind of the dispute whether to test or not, uh, whether it is safe, uh, what will it change. Um, so we don't really have the you know full scope of information, but I would say that um, what we see from the research, public uh, health research, uh, this is this model of the drug uh, drug. Uh, um, Addict um, uh, people who uh, who get HIV by uh, by the blood transmission, and uh, it also connects with the pattern of uh, uh, of drug uh, we used in this part of Europe. Actually, uh, in in the United States, in the Western Europe, uh, these are mostly pill drugs. We have the opioids, we have the uh, so-called compote, and so on. Uh, so the, and it also connected with the times of transformation that it was the drugs of the poor uh, which were available uh, for them. So that is one thing. Uh, and the second thing is the discourse. And the discourse in the 1990s, we have a very um, visible shift from the 1980s when it was considered the gay disease. And it was, in my opinion, it was some kind of the influx of the narrative from the West, uh, but in the 1990s uh, starts the huge topic of narcomania and uh, and when I, I did research in the archives, like narcomania totally uh, covers everything in the 1990s. Uh, that's the second part and the third part uh, is um, the sources we have now. Uh, for example, my oral history research. Uh, it is a problem to uh, m to uh, find respondents, to find interviewees uh, f um, outside of the, I would say, activist group. Um, and people, uh, gay people, are well connected. And uh, 
we have uh, we had uh, a better access to them to interview them for example to get the memoirs to uh, the replica is a lgbtq plus uh, press so uh, we get people uh, we get the memoirs of the people we we have co co contact with and uh, when we try to access other people it's it's different sometimes it's much harder and uh, especially i would say uh, people who uh, use drugs uh, they tend to be marginalized more and uh, they tend to refuse more um, and uh, we also have a problem with i would say warsaw centric perspective the huge cities perspective especially <laughs> that it's very hard to find respondents or memoirs or anything uh, from small cities and we know that we have this very interesting migration movement of course to the big cities when we have the drug opportunities and so on but we also have a very interesting migration movement to the smaller cities of the people who come back to their homes to get cared especially by the mothers that's the trope uh, which is very prevalent in the narratives uh, so uh, yeah we have kind of problem with the sources and we have to find ways to overcome it. Uh, there is a private archive of Marek Kotański, uh, I would say the family archive, and um, uh, Monar has as the, you know, um, they had their documents, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question to you, Evelina. Um, I was wondering how the HPV vaccine played out in Poland and if it brought back any of these, if you see any connections between conversations, potential conversations around that, the infection, the sexuality, the blame, and, and uh, these uh, very troubling um, processes that you described. We have to, yeah, okay. Uh, I think this is a very important question, but actually this is something that is more visible and referred to the, I don't know, the recent times, because it's uh, the, the popularity of H, H, uh, H, uh, to this vaccine is, the popularity of this vaccine is something very uh, new, actually, and it, it, there is a still, in, in media, this is, there is a still big discussion about that. And uh, this fascination is voluntary, so you, it's not that it's compulsory like uh, m many of others. And uh, yeah, and I actually, I, I wasn't uh, focusing on that aspect in my research, so I cannot um, answer answer you more and tell you more about that. But I think it's very, very important, and, and probably this is something that really changed, uh, or ch is changing the the narratives about sexual. Uh, connotations around uh, around cancer uh, yeah but I, I'm, I'm unfortunately I cannot say any more anything more yeah. um, so next question oh yeah well <clears throat> Thank you for, for the very interesting talks. And I have another question concerning the bo your both um, papers on HIV. And I just was wondering, because in, in, in Western Germany, for example, uh, the HIV crisis was like very important for measures of prevention. And so um, I was wondering how the Polish state reacted to HIV in, in Poland? What kind of measures did they take? So, for example, when you say, which I think is very interesting, that in Poland were mainly drug people who are drug addicted who got infected, um, did they like have special programs for for people who are, got addicted to prevent um, the infections to spread? Maybe you can kind of elaborate on that. I would be very interested in. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. For, it's actually a very interesting issue connected with this uh, very specific uh, Central East European, I would say, post-socialist context. Uh, that we have the state which is um, 
in crisis. Uh, so at, uh, uh, in the early 1990s, we see a very interesting shift um, of power and agency to the NGOs and third sector and the huge influx of money uh, from the Western countries, from WHO uh, to the uh, NGOs. And, and also the state was uh, very much in uh, um, working together with uh, all these uh, bottom-to-top organizations. And um, actually it was a very... Um, it's very interesting from the point of organizing the, um, I would say, um, uh, feeling uh, and a part of the public space, uh, making activist movements and so on. So all these patients organizations that uh, that emerged uh, during the HIV crisis in the 1990s. Uh, it was very interesting socially, and uh, um, and also it kind of helped organize the um, LGBTQ plus movement in Poland. I would say, for example, Lambda Warszawa got uh, money for prophylactic uh, actions and so on. Uh, so I would say, um, yeah, it's very interesting as the kind of the shifting of power, which and that I would uh, the organizations uh, when you inter uh, d interview the activists they say that it finished uh, just before entering the European Union they say that it's like early 2000s that then the power shifted and then it was back to the central organizations of the state and of course there were prophylactic actions uh, in Poland actually we had a very interesting, different way to approach uh, drug uh, users problem that we had more, I would say, not using and uh, abstinence of uh, substances uh, model, which was promoted by Monar and which was which was actually criticized a lot. And uh, but we also had some uh, substitutions programs, but uh, less less than in the other countries, I would say. Yeah, the, the, this is exactly what is m the most fascinating uh, part of this story is that with the quite conservative politics of the state and the um, the official narration being uh, quite conservative and cautious about talking uh, in terms of uh, any kind of prevention and um, sexual uh, or uh, connected to drug usage. So on the on the level of state, it was quite uh, cautious or even uh, censored. But on the but the real work was going on in the with the NGOs financed mostly um, f with sources outside of Poland. So there were two kind of politics going on at the same time, and this is all very, of course, complex and complicated. Also in terms of uh, uh, soul organization as Monar itself, because it really started up uh, the harm reduction politics in Poland with giving away the syringes. The, the clean syringes and uh, really like establishing places where uh, people could use drugs safely and they were really having this politics already in 1990 like the, uh, you saw the pictures from the protests of people who were against establishing houses for the HIV infected people in Poland uh, and the people were protesting and at the same time in Warsaw there was a place where uh, people could use drugs safely and there were like syringes circulating in, in different uh, places where Monar was active. So And then Kotański was uh, one day he was giving the, um, the condoms, the other day he said in the interview that he's against it. So it was kind of all circulating around the, uh, the um, like, it, yeah, so it was producing a lot of complexities, let's say, or uh, ambivalences. But the, the last thing I would add is that uh, this um, very, uh, like, a hot 
kind of atmosphere or the very intensive atmosphere that was uh, surrounding HIV AIDS with the really a lot of NGOs um, established and really hard working in the field. Uh, it produced a very interesting situation where the actual law concerning the HIV AIDS uh, prevention and healthcare was written together with all the interested parties. So this is, I think, one of the few, if not the sole example of such a collaboration where the actual law was written not by politicians, but together with social partners. And this law it was like really uh, cutting edge, but of course it didn't get finance. <laughs> so it kind of uh, is there, but it, it wasn't really realized like it was planned. Anyway, there was this process, all the interested parties were taking part in negotiations and they established a system. So this is kind of interesting turnout of things. Okay, we have time for one more question from the audience. Short comment. Oh, okay. uh, well, it's, uh, I suppose it's a false picture that it was only Monar. Because I have, a, I have a relative, a psychologist, who worked with drug addicts in the 1880s and 1890s. And she worked in Rybienko for... Uh, for it was a center that was owned by, by, uh, by the state and was financed by the, by the state. But there was rivalry between Monar and uh, between those ordinary state... Uh, uh, backed of state finance organization, and Kotaisky was a really a master in advertisement. So he became uh, very popular in various kinds of media. And uh, there was also a discussion uh, between them about the methods. They had the methods, different methods of treating addicts. And uh, so it was a serious discussion because. I lived sometimes with her, and I, 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 she told me a lot about it. I, I uh, forgot a lot from this. But I remember those evening, uh, many hours talks about the blames of Kotansky <laughs> and his uh, bad uh, misos. And uh, I remember there was an action. It was, it, must, it was financed by the state in 1990s, <laughs> a free syringe for addicts in drugstores. But addicts didn't have any official uh, documents that they are addicts. But the drugstore uh, seller just looked at the person and said, he must be an addict, <laughs> and gave this. this. So I, I, I remember this, so it's not only Kotansky, but it's true that uh, everything was under finance. So the whole state was under finance and it was also under the in, in the in 1990s, under the rule of uh, of uh, social democrats, doesn't matter which kind of uh, political party is at the same time ruling. Okay, thank you so much. I allow myself to ask another question, and. Uh, Speaking of uh, Slavica and Małgorzata uh, papers, uh, I like the thing that it is like strongly connected with several issues. Like you have illness, you have politics, you have nationality, you have sexuality. I know there are differences, but I want to ask you maybe slightly too general question and maybe a little bit simplifying and I'm sorry for that. But I'm just wonder about the politics of or forgetting and remembering. And listening to your papers, I had this idea and I want to ask you, do you agree with it or do you want to elaborate more on it? That we have certain politics of for forgetting and remembering and from your papers we can say that probably forgetting can be described as something which is highly discipli disciplinatory and uh, maybe attend to add, uh, normalize things. And at the same time, can we say that remembering can be 
subverting or even revolutionary? <laughs> if it's too much, I'm sorry, I know you are tired, but yeah. I think that uh, remembering is uh, something that is necessary in this period when, I don't know, COVID is finished. And uh, remembering uh, about uh, Variola Vera through the movie Maybe it's remembering of another period of our life. And uh, I think that uh, that period of remembering is connected with uh, uh, validation of the measures that were uh, applied during the communist period. And uh, I think that uh, those measures are necessary, according to me, uh, during COVID also. And I'm not uh, for those who are protesting against the, the COVID measures. Also, I know that uh, all COVID measures can be put uh, under the uh, politi uh, can be used uh, through the, uh, um, by the governments to stop moving, to uh, stop uh, acting the, through the uh, through the um, and uh, um, projecting the the ideas of uh, of, uh, of freedom. But uh, I think that uh, during the epidemia, uh, usually uh, some oppressive measures are necessary. Because of that, uh, I was uh, speaking about uh, those measures that uh, are in one perspective uh, uh, good uh, when, uh, when they are applied uh, during 1972, and uh, also during uh, uh, COVID period. And uh, that is uh, my uh, interpretation of uh, oppressive methods and politics in the past and in the present. Yeah, I guess uh, what you are very right is that um, both uh, forgetting and remembering Okay. Uh, what what you are very right, um, it's uh, both forgetting and remembering cannot be uh, kind of assessed by, you know, the simple um, social media sign uh, I don't, I like. Because what interests me is um, how and for whom they could be useful uh, on the one hand and how it changes when times go on and we are coming back. Uh, because um, this uh, coming back to the Spanish flu, it's um, not for nothing. It's really making us to rethink not so much epidemies, this epidemies, um, uh, pandemies, um, but more uh, our attitude towards um, 
history narration because uh, it's not for for it's it's for a cause that it is she historian and it's uh, even if there was a female a male doctor and uh, a kind of male detective and you have in both the detective figure is making this kind of uh, Grand narrative or mainstream story with you know causes and um, uh, this causal logic uh, working on and um, producing very homogeneous narratives here um, uh, female fig uh, figure and this uh, kind of intersex body uh, they are in in a sense um, making these stories or showing off this story as being constructed. So, um, and it, on the other hand, it, it, it is that remembering is always dismembering. You just have to um, make some, uh, f uh, some uh, um, choices what to entangle, what to live uh, um, uh, beyond your entanglement. And what is beyond, it will be, uh, in most cases, the not as source for another story that will be told and so it's it's not uh, that you can tell a part uh, forgetting and remembering they are always um, entangled together and depending on you as well and your perspective the perspective you take something will be remembered but in another perspective it will be forgotten it's depending on on what you focus on what you are interested in it's always in a sense in the eye of the beholder as well not only in the material so that's i'm not so much interested in the essences like it's good it's bad or or assessment of essences i'm more interested in the processuality of the performativity of the what's what's going on and uh, it's cut in this very moment by this narration on that narration and uh, um, the kind of event this narration causes cause at, at the moment yeah thanks okay. thank you very much I have some additional questions, but probably I will save them for the coffee break uh, to give you some time to, to get some more energy for the last panel, because we still have one to go. So thank you so much. Huge applause for our <laughs> panelists. And we have almost 20 minutes.